to answer your question, I would like to ask the technical staff behind to display the picture, the map. Um, just this is the map of Georgia, and uh, I just before I move to answering the questions, I uh, wanted to visualize for you what I will be talking about. This is Georgia, and those um, you know uh, colorful uh, parts of Georgia are so-called gray zones occupied by Russian Abkhazian region of Georgia and South Ossetian region. Uh, and those lines, those boundaries, uh, we call it uh, occupation line. Sometimes we call it dividing line. Sometimes we call ABL, administrative boundary line. Uh, so these are the occupied territories and also these are the areas uh, adjacent to the occupied territories and these are the areas where also people, residents of those areas are under permanent uh, risks and are especially vulnerable. So uh, what are we, uh, how we see our role as an institution, as a public defender and human rights defender? First of all, what we are doing is, uh, my office is doing is, we are doing monitoring of human rights situation. Obviously, uh, like international community and uh, Georgian government, public defender's office does not have access to these uh, territories. We don't have any presence there, but we are doing monitoring through like obtaining information from local uh, partners, civil society groups. We are monitoring and gathering information available uh, from publicly available media resources. We have also frequent communication with uh, uh, IDPs, with uh, people living close to ABL, and also we uh, try to uh, get information information from eyewitnesses sometimes when people cross the uh, occupation line and get to the Georgian controlled territories we often talk with them um, with the victims uh, with the, uh, with persons who've been deprived um, who've been uh, detained and they share uh, with us uh, their experience um, um, therefore, this is probably, the information is of course limited, uh, but uh, this is how we are uh, monitoring the situation. Obviously, uh, we are reporting about the human rights situation. Sometimes we make uh, like emergency statements if we consider that the, there is an urgency to uh, publicly react on the uh, individual human rights issues. Uh, but mostly we, uh, we are reflecting all our findings in our annual human rights parliamentary reports and also special reports that we dedicate to the human rights situation in occupied uh, territories. Um, well, um, interesting thing is that uh, we are providing support not only, uh, we are reacting on the applications and also we are acting proactively if we see that there is uh, some problematic human rights trends and issues. Uh, we are not only reacting on the applications that comes from national uh, ethnic Georgians or people holding uh, Georgian passports, but we are uh, probably one of the rarest uh, Georgian state uh, institutions who also you know, receives applications from ethnic Abkhazians or ethnic Ossetians who approach us and ask us for assistance and obviously we are uh, providing their, them support. Unfortunately, those kind of applications is not happening frequently. It's like rare occasions, but uh, still uh, we uh, receive some applications from, from them as well. Um, well, um, we have um, also very close cooperation and uh, communication with international community as international partners give us the opportunity to commun communicate our assessments and findings and recommendations to the international level. Uh, and in this connection, I would like to note the importance of yearly consolidated report on the conflict in Georgia prepared by the Secretary General of Council of Europe. Uh, uh, we contribute to develop such reports, uh, whether by Council of Europe or any other international uh, organizations uh, uh, that cover and concern the protection of the rights of uh, human rights in occupied territories. Um, we are doing also uh, educational um, 
type of work and um, this is very important. For instance, we are conducting trainings for um, conflict affected population, for youth, for women, for civil activists, for media representatives. And uh, during these you know, trainings, we are talking and discussing with them the <coughs> concept of human rights. And uh, uh, finally, I would like to also mention the confidence building type of work that we are engaged. Um, fortunately, uh, we, there, there were um, a number of projects carried out and supported by the Council of Europe. Uh, it's like their confidence building programs. And this program facilitated and organized like pure human rights platform um, and meetings with between Georg, ethnic Georgians, Abkhazians, South Ossetians, and Public Defender's Office actively took part in these uh, meetings where we uh, talked only about human rights issues that concerned everybody and also discussed the solutions. Unfortunately, uh, after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, those type of, you know, personal meetings has been suspended, but I uh, hope that it will be uh, continued in the future. So probably these are the five major key areas and mm. uh, you know, activities that we are active, if actively engaged. And, and thank you, Nin. And, and you've mentioned the challenges there, and I'm sure they are formidable. Is there anything you wanted to expand upon? I mean, well, you simply don't uh, have access for a start. There are a lot of challenges, obviously, yeah. and for us, number one challenge is the access to the territory, obviously. Um, the problem is that no comprehensive monitoring and evaluation of human rights situation have been uh, carried out on, on those territories for many years, even decades, I would say, and uh, there is the need of uh, conducting such a you know, human rights monitoring type of work. Um, well, um, the, another challenge is that uh, although I have mentioned that we have contacts with uh, some residents of occupied uh, territories, but it's like the, those contacts are very, very limited because people, residents of those territories are very much afraid of the persecution and even the criminal investigation against them because there were a number of cases when, uh, you know, residents have been charged, criminally charged and persecuted because they were uh, accused of uh, having communication with Georgian authorities. So obviously we are very, very careful and sometimes we have to, uh, you know, have very confidential um, you know, communication with them. Uh, there are also a lot of issues that we cannot loudly speak uh, and sometimes it's, you know, um, we have to sometimes uh, uh, decide whether it is better to go public and be mm -hmm. loud about the problem or it's better to, you know, be uh, silent because uh, it's about the life uh, of people and uh, you should be very careful about it. Um, if, uh, if you let me, I, I would like to very briefly list what are the key human rights issues which uh, shows the necessity of international presence on those territories. There is only Red Cross who's, who is present there, but you know their, their work is very limited and uh, it's like purely humanitarian. First of all, it's borderization, uh, which means that the Russian so-called border police uh, constantly you know installing and building the uh, barbed wire fences along the occupation line and those you know fences go through the property and the land and you know backyards and gardens of uh, people and deny uh, their access to their property and to their belonging it also extremely limits the uh, right to move uh, and it's like so essential for the residents of those territories because they don't have access there to the uh, like quality healthcare services, for instance. And we had a number of occasions when people died because they were not allowed to cross uh, the so-called checkpoints, which are like sometimes like uh, permanently closed and people died because they could not cross the you know those closed uh, areas. Also, we had uh, cases when people died during crossing the river because once again, the checkpoints were closed. They wanted to get to the Georgia control territory and people are taking risk to cross like mm. uh, the river sometimes. And uh, unfortunately we had casualties. Uh, also, 
uh, well, um, illegal, there is like quite widespread and it ha it's happening almost every day, illegal detention of residents um, of the villages close to the occupation line. Almost every day, sometimes even the um, so-called Russian border police abducts um, Georgian residents of those villages and uh, um, they spend considerable uh, time in, uh, you know, penitentiary detention centers or facilities, um, which, um, you know, and uh, there is no any, you know, human rights uh, monitoring or control of those facilities. And this is, uh, you know, very um, critical, you know, problem that concerns uh, the population and it's like, the part of their everyday life. Therefore, you know, I think that uh, the presence of international human rights monitoring organizations or their visits or their monitorings are crucial for, for these people. Um, and um, I think that international organizations uh, in the occupied territories, uh, um, they mainly work on humanitarian issues and they, their work are limited uh, and it's crucial that international organizations are allowed uh, to enter those territories uh, and be engaged in peace uh, talks and in confidence building uh, uh, activities. I know that it's difficult, it requires political negotiations, but I, th I mean, you should always remember that this is happening in European territories and uh, you can't be, you know, you mm. can't ignore this. And uh, as, as it was rightly mentioned today, human rights, fundamental human rights are universal and these people also deserve to uh, be equally you know, protected under international law. Thank you very much for those, those, those powerful reflections graphically bringing to light the, the real world issues that you highlight there. Um, just br very briefly then, you've mentioned the annual report. Um, more generally, the, would you be able to say very briefly on what you might consider that the Council of Europe and member mm -hmm. states could do to improve this drastic situation? Well, uh, first of all, it's good that um, this kind of discussions is going on because it is necessary and it, as it was visible from today's discussion, you know, I think everybody understands that uh, there is not enough effort put in this direction and I honestly think that the Council of Europe uh, is an international organization which has very strong human rights institutions, very powerful, very functional, and I think that you know, Council of Europe, first of all, should put more effort and use all its uh, political and non-political institutions and tools to uh, improve access uh, to non-government non controlled territories. Um, it was mentioned several times today, CIP, the role of CPT, and I also wanted to raise this issue. Well, uh, once again, uh, I understand that it is difficult to negotiate the access of CPT to those territories, but it's not impossible because we had precedent, we have experience. For instance, the last visit uh, CPT uh, carried out in uh, you know, occupied uh, um, Georgian territories was in 2009, right after the war. Um, and I think that if there will be you know, enough effort put, put uh, uh, towards this direction, if there will be po real political will, um, maybe it's, I mean, it might become you know, possible and uh, I think that CPT is probably the one uh, instrument or tool uh, that can be engaged. Uh, well, uh, another issue, another possibility is that, um, well, I think that for sure the Council of Europe should continue supporting the confidence building uh, meetings and programs at least in Georgia, because this is really rare and exceptional opportunities for Georgian uh, and uh, Abkhazian and Ossetian uh, residents, because we almost don't have any other platforms or venues where we can meet and talk solely on human rights issues. So please, please continue supporting uh, those activities. Um, of course, the uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, plays, can play you know, 
significant role, and I would like to highlight the importance of ECHR judgment in the second case of Georgia versus Russia, because this judgment, um, you know, in, in this ruling, European Court found Russia to be responsible for violation of a number of articles of European Convention, and it's also said that um, Russian Federation exercised effective control over the territory of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, and uh, this control, you know, uh, and he is also, Russia is also responsible for continued violation of human rights on those territories. Obviously, this has um, like legal and historical meaning and importance for, for Georgia, and I also think that uh, CHR judgments will also have very positive impact on other legal international processes, like you know that uh, International Criminal Court is also investigating the cases alleged um, war crimes uh, committed during Georgian-Russian conflict and war, and I'm sure that those you know, interpretations and judgments will also have very positive in, uh, outcome and impact. And uh, lastly, uh, or maybe in the end, I would also add some uh, points. Uh, and okay, <laughs> I will let we'll others come back to you in a minute, but yeah, thank sure. you very much for those very valu valuable insights, and I'm sure I speak for all of us in wishing you well in your future work in thank relation you. to this such an important field. But I will turn, if I may, to Jorg, uh, uh, Jorg Palaukovic, uh, the Director of, of Legal Advice and Public International Law at the Council of Europe. Thank you, uh, Jorg. Um, can you start by sharing your experience um, of uh, negotiations and practical avenues of cooperation in relation to conflict-affected regions within the Council of Europe? Are you mm. able to offer some reflections on that, please? Yeah. <clears throat> well, let me first start by, um, by thanking uh, Andrew and the Irish Centre for organising this magnificent event and having brought, I mean, speaking for me, and I think some colleagues having brought us out of the Strasbourg bubble <laughs> to confront both academia and NGOs, I think we stand so much to gain from such exchanges and uh, they do not take place so often, so I'm really happy to be here. I thought I would start with uh, a personal experience, uh, um, but I think on, on which one can draw some lessons. Uh, when I had barely worked for 10 years in the Council of Europe, I got a very interesting assignment, <laughs> and I was sent to a mission, it was in March 2003, to Kosovo. And at the time, it was still barely four years after the NATO intervention, and Kosovo was still firmly administered by the United Nations on the one hand, and there was the military presence, of course, of KFOR. But uh, already then, the need arose. Uh, I think at that time, nobody spoke about gray zones or black holes, at least I can't remember. But there was the issue that there was this territory after the NATO intervention left without, left practically excluded from all the Council of Europe or other monitoring mechanisms. And we wanted really to find a pragmatic and, uh, but also legally sound uh, solution. And I must say, I, um, so I negotiated of course, with support from colleagues in Strasbourg, and I didn't go alone, I got it with colleagues from uh, both the Framework Convention and the CPT, because, of course, for strategic reasons, given also the origin of the conflict, protection of the rights of persons belonging to national minorities and detention conditions were sort of two very prime concerns at that moment. And uh, I must say I found a very competent and very nice uh, and like me <laughs> looking for practical solution interlocutor in Alexander Borg Olivier, who was a Maltese lawyer and he was basically the UNMIX uh, legal advisor. And uh, we finalized in record time uh, two agreements uh, allowing the effective application uh, of these two Council of Europe, quite important Council of Europe mechanisms in the territory, which at the time, I recall, was still under United Nations interim administration. And we did so in a status neutral way. Uh, it was stressed, uh, of course, the, the, the um, 
the uh, agreements explicitly state that this was without prejudice to the status. And, uh, but it was a very effective uh, mechanism and it allowed monitoring by both the Framework Convention Advisory Committee and the CPT to uh, actually monitor the situation. And I think it was also, by the way, and I think it was a premiere, it was the first time ever that the United Nations administered territory submitted to a regional human rights mechanism. Something I think at the time nobody paid so much attention, but with hindsight, I think it was quite a, also an acknowledgement by the United Nations of the importance of Council of Europe mechanisms. And um, we, uh, I think this, uh, the, the participation, the, uh, these mechanisms, they contributed a lot to, uh, to bringing Kosovo uh, to, to effectively monitor situation and bringing further the, uh, the state of human rights in these two very strategic fields. And based on this, uh, on this experience, the Secretary General then, once uh, the UN administration's powers were reduced, uh, and, and in fact the Kosovo authorities took over most exercise of public powers, he pursued uh, this approach with this uh, very famous, uh, Andrew mentioned, idea of functional uh, capacity and to have uh, the Council of Europe uh, pursuing this, uh, this active monitoring, status neutral, and uh, just based on the simple fact that uh, you have to, we have these territories, and, uh, but you bring them effectively under these uh, monitoring mechanisms. And uh, this was, at the time, was not uh, seen as a problem, not by any, not by Serbia, not by any other country. Of course, you can argue, and I, I admit this is an objection, this is a very, it was referred to this morning, sui generis case, and you had precisely through the existence of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1244, you had an internationally recognized legal framework, uh, so nobody could contest uh, that UNMIC concluded on the basis of their powers uh, these agreements, and it is different, and Kosovo is different mm -hmm. from all the other. But the idea behind it, uh, acknowledging that there is de facto <coughs> effective exercise of public powers by de facto authorities, and that you have to engage somehow with them, of course, without recognizing them, that you have to engage with them if you want to achieve anything on yes. the ground. Uh, I think this idea, I think, has a promise also for and wider implications. Yes, and so maybe you could reflect on that. We're going to ask you, uh, if you had any brief thoughts on sort of treaty practice generally, but perhaps that's a, a, yeah. and you reflect back there on Kosovo as a unique example. But mm. can you see, looking forward then to brief reflections on treaty practice, but also yeah. how the Council of Europe could um, assist states more going forward? Yeah. Um, I will just very briefly mention, being a lawyer, you must <laughs> bear with me. I have to come back to what Stuart Wallace also called uh, that we are... After all, our action is based on, uh, on some legal instrument. And in fact, it's the, I mean, for me, it has always been the strength of the Council of Europe that our action is at least to a large extent based on legally binding instruments. And uh, it is interesting in preparation for this seminar, and uh, I think there's a slide, but I think it was also distributed. And the treaty office, uh, we receive, in fact, quite a lot of declarations uh, regarding these famous territories of contested jurisdiction. But you will see, and I will be really brief on this, uh, but as we will see that the practice is not at all consistent. Uh, you have some states who do it very consistently and others very less consistently. And uh, from a legal point of view, and I think this is just the, the only point I want to mention briefly, there was also, there is a, there is a sort of interrogation. Uh, the Court of Human Rights in the Ilashku case, he said such a, uh, dealing with the declaration regarding Transnistria by Moldova, and the court said, I quote, can the, such a uh, declaration cannot be equated with a reservation and must thus be deemed invalid. 
this was in the admissibility decision, but with all due respect, I would differ, uh, and in the treaty office, we have not treated these declarations as reservations in the sense of the Vienna Convention, simply because they are like a factual statement. I come back to the issue they, that I mentioned at the beginning. They simply acknowledge or they make public to the other parties the fact that the state that is still sees, that is still the territorial exercises territorial that to which the territory belongs under international law is not in a position to ensure the rights uh, for the population living in these territories. And as such a statement, I think this, uh, you cannot object to such a declaration. On the contrary, it's even of, I mean, I think it's of interest for the international community. And, uh, of course, there are two caveats. Uh, I should mention this such a declaration cannot ab absolve from obligation where this state would exercise jurisdiction under the <laughs> admittedly sometimes difficult <laughs> to interpret uh, but still existing during the case law of the court. Uh, if, if this is the case that the court finds that the state exercises jurisdiction, then this uh, he remains, the state remains responsible. And of course, there is also, like the court said in Ilashku, an obligation by the territorial state, Moldova in that case, to use all legal and diplomatic means available in the attempt to continue to secure ECHR rights. But as I said, very often this will be simply legally impossible. And in possibilium, you have no obligation under international law. But to develop on this, uh, and also to be not too long, I think what, uh, coming back also to this uh, experience uh, with Kosovo, and uh, I think the idea of functional capacity can be, you can build on this uh, from, uh, from a legal point of view. Um, I think, of course, the, the monitoring mechanism that is most, has, most, uh, has most potential in this field is clearly, as Neil said, the commissioner, because he has, he, she has this broad uh, mandate. But also other monitoring mechanisms may, uh, I think, be more active. And also the member states, of course, should facilitate such activity. And uh, there are, of course, and this is also an idea the Secretary General expressed uh, in, it, in, or in 2014, there are, of course, a lot of issues, uh, practical issues. I just name them quickly. Uh, how can access to such territories be ensured? Which member state or other entity is required to agree to access or issue visas? For what geographical point is the access to territory in question to be affected? You've seen recently in Saporizia, this was also an issue. <laughs> Which state or entity is responsible for the security of the delegation and for ensuring respect of its privileges and immunities? How can monitoring bodies, interlocutors in the region be protected from reprisals? And following the visit to which state, states or entities should the report be sent? Who should be allowed to provide comments? All these are not easy, I don't say this is easy questions, but I think they, I think we need a reflection and, and possibly not only reflection, but action <laughs> on such issues. Uh, the Parliamentary Assembly came up in their recommendation with uh, 2140 with, their, with the presumption that all member states would consent to the, uh, to the access of monit independent monitoring mechanisms. But the Committee of Ministers did not really follow up on this. And uh, it is true that apart from the CPT, which I think there you can also legally quite firmly argue that they benefit from such a presumption thanks to combined reading of Articles 8 and 9 of the CPT Convention, for other monitoring bodies this is not so obvious. So maybe instead of <coughs> relying on a presumption why not, uh, but uh, it's just an idea I want to launch, uh, why not have a strong have a commitment, a political declaration or something whereby all Council of Europe member states would commit that they do everything to facilitate uh, access by monitoring mechanisms to such territories. And this could be accompanied possibly by some guidelines on these questions that I, that I uh, have enumerated. 
And uh, I think this could be a way, I think from a legal point of view, you, you find ways. Uh, of course, there is the limit, it was mentioned several times, so I will not <laughs> repeat it again. You must avoid everything that can be either directly or implicitly be seen as a recognition of, uh, of a new uh, state entity uh, in these territories. And, uh, of course, the Council of Europe has to also act within the framework of existing UN Security Council uh, and uh, General Assembly resolutions. But with the argument that our work is strictly for the benefit of the local population, I think these legal hurdles can be overcome. And uh, this is... Uh, was acknowledged, for example, by the International Court of Justice in the Namibia advisory opinion, uh, where they said also there, with respect to the recognition of legal acts of de facto regimes, they said such the non-recognition should not result in depriving the people of any advantages derived from international cooperation. And also the Court of Human Rights referred to this in the Loisy Du and Xenidis Arrestes uh, cases. So there is an international law, a clear basis for that, uh, that for the benefit of the local population, you can engage with de facto regimes. And I think this could be and should be explored more by the Council of Europe. Thank, thank you very much. That's a very tangible, specific thing which could be taken forward and sounds have a very solid legal footing as well as obviously being potentially of great assistance to this. Thank you, Jörg. Um, Pavel, thank you so much for waiting patiently there. Um, uh, allow me to come then to Pavel... Uh, Kasaku, um, who is a uh, lawyer uh, of Promolex, uh, at, at Promolex, an NGO association um, in Moldova. Um, we've heard from Nino that some of the, the difficulties faced by those that were campaigning on behalf of um, individuals affected in these areas. I dare say this is uh, an area that is quite uh, treacherous to be involved with. Um, we'd, we'd love to hear more from you about that. Thank you. Um, so, as a prominent civil society organisation active in that region, that part of the world, could you give us a sense of the work of Promolex um, in, in the Transnistria, Transnistria region, please? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for, uh, for invitation. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to leave Moldova and the bubble of Moldova. So, it's a, it's a good, uh, good event. Um, well, yes, uh, we are an NGO. I think we are a big successful NGO from, uh, from Moldova. Maybe some of you heard of about Promolex um, because of um, monitoring election, others because we have some results in uh, strategic litigation in uh, front of uh, mechanism of Council of Europe. Um, we have these two big programs, uh, human rights program and uh, uh, um, democratic uh, processes. So that's why we monitor election and uh, try to protect and uh, have some cases in uh, strategic litigation. Um, we are working in Transnistrian field um, for almost 18 years. So, uh, my previous colleague, I can say that she uh, she uh, told uh, she told uh, the same issues that we we faced because you changed just the, just the, the title and the, the issue are the same um, uh, borderization uh, abductions um, our access or the lack of access in the in the Transnistrian region. Uh, for example, Promolex doesn't have access since uh, 2015 because we have a criminal case uh, against us in Transnistria region because of our uh, activities. Um, but because this is, um, a, I don't know, a practical panel, I'll give you some, um, some figures, some statistics. So about strategic litigation we sent in... Um, at the um, European Court of Human Rights, more than 80, 80 cases. In those, uh, ca for more than 60 cases, already the European Court uh, gave uh, a judgment. Uh, maybe you know uh, two of them 
uh, have been examined by your by Grand Chamber is the case uh, uh, Katan and others. Uh, my previous colleague said about Latin script schools from Transnistria, and this is the case. And the other case that was examined by Grand Chamber is um, uh, the Moser case. The case. Uh, again, we handled to we, we managed to to have maybe. I don't know, maybe the biggest case in front of your European Court of Human Rights, more than 1,600 of applicants. It's about the right of property in the in um, Nubasar district, about farmers. Uh, it was a huge, huge effort to document with a small, uh, small team. And um, before 2015, when we had access in Transnistria region, we organized uh, uh, trainings for people from Transnistria, for uh, civic activists, from, uh, for um, journalists, and so on. And uh, previously, we had some trainings for judges, for prosecutors, how they should uh, um, manage or handle the view, um, how they should examine this human rights issue in Transnistrian in Transnistrian region. Uh, yes, we have uh, we have a lot of challenge, challenges to to document, to protect, uh, to promote um, human rights in, in this uh, in this region. Um, after 2015, it's harder because we uh, we are document the situation by far, by, by distance, but we try to, to go in the villages, in the towns near the security zone. Uh, we, we are lucky because people already uh, know about us, know about uh, results, about uh, how can we uh, help. We try to be uh, a bridge between uh, people and, uh, and government. We try to um, uh, responsibility to give more responsibility to our authorities in, in, uh, in, in these cases. And my colleague said about this declaration in Ilashko case. Uh, I don't know, maybe, it's, maybe it's a good thing because uh, European court uh, invalidate this, uh, this declaration because Moldova now uh, try to do more in, this, in these cases because um, uh, they, they uh, they every time uh, uh, said, "Okay, we don't control this territory. We can do what we what uh, can we do in this uh, in these cases." So maybe it's a good uh, a, a, a good thing because they have more responsibility. And now after the Russia after Russia Russian Federation um, uh, has been excluded from the Council of Europe, maybe uh, Moldovan authorities should be more active in, this, uh, in, in these issues, because I think European Court was uh, very soft with them. It was... Um, I so, don't so do you see the possibility then for there to be more effective uh, opportunities then for, for uh, this part of the world? I, I think um, uh, European, um, European Court of Human Rights maybe is the most effective instrument to protect people from, from Transnistrian region, and we have a lot of uh, example in this uh, in, in this in this field, um, and uh, and and we have to to say that our Moldovan authorities uh, made a lot of reforms, uh, try to help people from uh, from Transnistrian uh, from Transnistrian region, but uh, I, I have to say uh, it's not enough. It's not enough because people uh, just to to give you an example. Uh, 2,000 people are, are, are uh, being deprived of liberty in Transnistria. It's maybe the biggest incarceration ra rate in, uh, in Europe. So, of course, it's not, it's, it's, it's not enough. Uh, that's why we try to, uh, to be insistent with them. Uh, yes, I understand Russia is also responsible, and uh, I don't know, 90% of European court uh, judgment of European Court of Human Rights said that Russia is responsible, but we uh, are expanding more uh, from uh, our authorities, from uh, Moldovan authorities. And in terms of um, what the Council of Europe can do, is there a receptiveness amongst 
local de facto authorities there, civil society more generally, to engage with the various standing set, standard setting initiatives that are available or programs that are available? Is there an appetite for that? Well, it's hard to say that there is a um, true civil society in Transnistria region. Yes, there is people who are um, try um, want more uh, democratic process, uh, rule of law, and uh, they want that their rights to be uh, respected or protected. But in, um, in terms of de facto authorities, I just give you some examples. Uh, in the last uh, five years, they made a lot of changes in the local, um, local legisl legislation, and all of these uh, changes is against the freedom of expression, against the freedom of uh, assembly, uh, there is a law uh, in the Transnistria region, the same like in Russia with foreign agents. Is the, um, if you, uh, in 2020, they approved a strategy against uh, extremism, the victims are journalists, people who are uh, vocal, who raised their voice, voices in, in Transnistria region. So you can't say that they want this, uh, they want those mechanisms, these institutions to be, um, uh, to be there in, 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 uh, in Transnistria region. Another, pro uh, against the same problem with, uh, with um, like in Georgia, access, access of uh, um, international uh, institutions, the lack of uh, monitoring, the lack of, um, and uh, all of these problems, I think, will give us another problem, impunity. No one is, is No one is uh, punished for 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 this uh, for these issues. Um, and and about and about um, effectiveness of the European Court of Human Rights or uh, institutions of uh, Council of Europe, we have a, a few uh, effects like um, this Namibia exception. We Kishinau can confirm the. Uh, facts, uh, civil facts in, uh, in Transnistria region, like deaths, uh, births. So it's a progressive, um, progressive uh, approach for people, just for people. Um, again, uh, again, it's about uh, farmers, about students, about teachers. Now there is no s those problems that were in 2002, 2004. So we can see uh, an improvement, but again, it's, uh, we don't think it's, it's enough. That's why, that's why we, we are an NGO. We have to put pressure um, uh, every you. day, every time. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pavel. Um, and thank you all to, uh, to all of you. We've really brought to life there the subject, um, shining some light on some very dark areas of human rights protection. Uh, Andrew, do we have a couple of minutes, um, a few minutes to just take a round of questions? Uh, I'll, I'll do that, and in doing so, give the opportunity before we conclude, if speakers want to say in a couple of bullet points their final reflections on matter, that'll be on matters. That'll be uh, an opportunity to do that. But let's therefore, um, so hands are, are going up. Um, uh, is that Efa? Who's hand? I can't see you. Efa, and then uh, uh, Philip, uh, Philip Leach. Um, you'll just introduce yourself as you do. Uh, even though we've heard from you already, of course. Okay, is the microphone working this time? Right. I think so. <laughs> Listen, sorry, it's not, it's not a question. It's actually just to add to Jorg's excellent presentation because when we're talking about the different conventions with monitoring mechanisms in these declarations, while Azerbaijan, Cyprus, Georgia, uh, Republic of Moldova, Serbia, and Ukraine aren't states parties to the European Social Charter, they are all state parties to the revised charter which is monitored in the same way as the European Social Charter, according to Article C of the 96 Charter's appendix. And I think the key thing I want to add there is Azerbaijan has, in fact, made a declaration. So it's simply to add to the very helpful information in your presenta presentation, York, and make clear how grey zones are not or arising in the context of the revised charter, which, of course, affords much greater protection than the original 1961 charter that you focused on in your handout. So, sorry, point more in addition than a question. A welcome one. Thank you. Uh, Philip. Thank you. Uh, Philip Leach, Middlesex University in London. Question for Niels, if I may. Niels, you, you, talk, you started by talking about the, the benefits of the breadth of the remit of the commissioner, but then you painted rather a, a more challenging picture about the realities. Is there, uh, is, there, is there more scope for the commissioner to do more in relation to contested areas, grey zones? If so, 
is there something that needs to be done to facilitate that, you know, either in terms of the remit or other ways? Or, or would you be more in favour of sort of putting in resources into Andrew's proposal of a special, I think you said a special representative uh, under the Secretary General on the tested areas? Would you, do you think a separate office that's, you know, is that a better route? Thanks. Let me just hold it. Is there another question before we ask uh, for Niels to respond to that specific one? Okay, well, Niels, would you be so kind? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I could be a bit mischievous and say, when do you create a special representative? It's when the other parts of the house aren't doing their job. <laughs> 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 um, I, I think there is more scope. I mean, the question is the investment of time and effort and, and the outcome. Um, as I said, it was a frustrating exercise in terms of kind of the, out, the human rights impact you can have. Um, but this could change. And I think that the commissioner has to be ready mm -hmm. for when this situation, Russia will not be the same Russia 10 years from now. It will either be a massively dark hole of repression or it will be better. Uh, it won't be the same as it is now. And we have to be prepared for that and the opportunities that arise when Russia changes. When the guns stop firing in Ukraine, the situation will have changed in Russia and in uh, the territories that Russia has control of. Um, I think that Kosovo is a huge opportunity uh, for the Council of Europe to engage um, and the commissioner to engage and others to engage. Um, you know, I, th I think Russia's expulsion opens, opens the door for, for Kosovo to come in and I think that Kosovo, the region in which Kosovo is, is a fragile region that's become more fragile um, so if the Council of Europe can play a role in stabilizing that region through its work in Kosovo, that will be money and time incredibly well spent uh, because the human rights consequences of, an, of a renewed conflict in that area are disastrous to even contemplate. Um, I think Northern Cyprus. Northern Cyprus is an opportunity zone which for some reason we haven't really engaged. None of the Council of Europe has engaged in Northern Cyprus sufficiently whether because of Turkey's ability to block it, whether because of the sensitivities of the Cypriot authorities. But to me, this is an area that requires much more attention than it's gotten until now. Um, so I, I think there are opportunities, um, but I think that the commissioner has to, you know, will be the first, if, if there are new opportunities, the commissioner will be the one who can go most easily. I remember, um, you know, when, when Maidan revolution started and people were being disappeared and, and, and abducted and tortured and so on, um, desperate Ukrainians came to my office and said, you have to come. And it was basically my, the, the commissioner was the only office that could, at a week's notice, go there on a mission, get access to places of detention, meet people, do, do things, um, and so on. You know, same thing with Crimea before the, the ill, before the, what would you call it, the ill-fated ill uh, Studman mission. I think, you know, I, I'm proud of the work we did there, um, but it was only because uh, of a weird uh, coincidence of events that, that we were able to go there. Um, so I think that there are opportunities, and the commissioner can and has t seized those opportunities, and there will be more opportunities because Russia will not remain the Russia it is today. <laughs> and, uh, but I think Northern Cyprus and, and, and Kosovo require more, more sustained attention from all the Council of Europe bodies. Thank you. Um, I said I would give each member of the panel, if they wished, an opportunity to have a, a quick last word, so I just do want to give that opportunity. Did, did, did anyone want to add anything? Nino, did you want to? Oh, yeah, I have my microphone <laughs> already. Well, um, to just summarize, um, we all agree that uh, the access to the territory uh, is the key problem, and we also recognize and agree that this is sometimes occupying power or de facto authorities who create problems to international monitoring uh, institutions and uh, tools to have access to these territories. But I would like also to you know, mention one very delicate aspect of this situation, which needs to be also taken into consideration. Uh, well, I think that um, you know, sometimes uh, states itself are also hesitant about 
uh, on is insisting from international uh, uh, communities and international monitoring bodies to carry out the monitoring mission because they are um, kind of uh, you know concerned about the language that uh, these uh, monitoring bodies will use. Uh, and they are afraid that maybe that type of visits and the reports and the language used in and the terminology used by reporters might be interpreted as a recognition. Uh, and uh, that's why states, in, well, in case of Georgia, I can uh, say that uh, this is a matter of concern. And um, I think that in my suggestion to Council of Europe, uh, political bodies uh, and non-political bodies would be that the idea that the human rights work is not like political work and uh, it does not contradict non-recognition policy, this is something that we know. We as an experts, as human rights defenders, as uh, you know, scholars, but this is not a concept and idea that is widely acknowledged, widely accepted, widely recognized, and politicians who are you know, uh, in the government of uh, the state, they are afraid that maybe the reports that will be delivered after such kind of monitoring missions might be you know, used by de facto authorities as a tool saying that you know, this is the recognition. Uh, so my advice would be to have more discussions, more political discussions, more information spread uh, about this idea that human rights work when the intention of the work is to protect the human rights, it does not represent the recognition. Uh, and uh, you know, <clears throat> states should understand that human rights are universal and de facto authorities are also responsible, al although they are not recognized as a government, but they also have obligations and duties to respect uh, universal uh, human rights, and they will also be responsible for violating uh, the human rights. So I think that there is the need of more discussions on, on these topics, that it, it, it don't become the you know, um, barrier for states to make the decision and to request the monitoring missions from international institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did, did, did you want to add anything quickly? Um, yeah, very briefly, I cannot leave uh, Ireland without quoting from Ulysses. <laughs> 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 then, um, by the way, I learned that his book, uh, that James Joyce completed this book or finalized this book the same year, 1922, when the Irish Free State was proclaimed. And one of the characters says there, uh, history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. And I'm afraid this is a bit the situation of Europe nowadays, and uh, these are dark days, as was said. But I hope from this conference there will be a wake-up call. <laughs> and um, because we need, I think everybody agrees, that uh, words are not enough. One needs uh, some, some action also. <clears throat> and maybe, after all, this... Uh, events, uh, or Russia's uh, atrocious war, all this, maybe it is also a new impetus that certain issues that have been blocked in discussions in the Committee of Ministers or the Assembly for so long, they can be freshly put on the agenda and more and can be solved uh, and brought forward at least intelligently and, and pragmatically. So I'm really happy that I made it to Ireland that um, we wholeheartedly <laughs> endorse what you've just said, of course. Mm. Okay, shall I wrap up? Or? Uh, a very short uh, thought, Thank you. Uh, like, like a conclusion. Uh, I think uh, to change something, uh, especially in, this, uh, in, the, in these territories, we, have, uh, we, we need three things, uh, political will, political will, and political will. So if it will be political will uh, of the government, but not only, and international institutions, but um, journalists, uh, NGOs, maybe, maybe something will change. Thank you, and um, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of us to say we, we wish you very well with your ongoing work in these fields, and um, we hope to meet again in the near future to hear progress in relation to them. It just remains for me then to thank our panel today, and I'm sure you'll thank them in the usual way. Bye. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, we...
So my, my sincere thanks to the panel, uh, the panelists, to um, uh, to Ed, of course, for 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 moderating, to Pavel, Nils, Jörg, uh, and Nino. Uh, that was really, really a, a fascinating discussion, and I, I I'm not going to keep you long for this conclusion. It'll be the shortest concluding remarks you've ever heard at a conference. But just to say sincerely. From, from my perspective, this has been an extraordinary privilege today. Um, I have never um, experienced uh, an event where we would have such vast expertise, both on the stage, at the, at the podium, uh, but also in, in, in the room. It, it's been a real extra, extraordinary privilege. Um, it seems clear to me that there is some kind of consensus that more should be done. Um, it seems clear to me that there, some of you at least agree that this is a serious ongoing and growing concern for the Council of Europe that for too long has stayed somehow in the darkness. Um, it also seems clear to me that we need to move from uh, the declaratory approach to a more decisive um, strategic approach. And, and I completely agree that bizarrely in the face of this terrible human tragedy that we witness every day in Ukraine, there's actually an opportunity now to reboot the system somehow and say that this is no longer acceptable that there are 10 million people that we've sort of ignored um, and, and to, to, to try to remedy that from the perspective of the system um, and not accepting just the excuse that we can do nothing because if there isn't the political will there. Actually, the Council of Europe has a statutory obligation to do more. That, I think, is, uh, is, quite, is quite clear. Um, there was extensive reference to the role of member states um, and the fourth summit and the high-level uh, group on the future of the organisation. I think that is, that, that is certainly a, a strong message that's come out of today. Um, and also, it, it, clearly, every speaker came back to the point of rights holder first. Uh, we need to think in a, in a, in a, in a human rights holder-centric way. Um, I will stop there, but what I do want to say is this is not the end of this conference. Um, uh, this is, I think, the beginning of a further discussion on this issue uh, and the many issues related. The intention would be to produce some form of outcome from this um, conference, because it would seem remiss not to do so. The form of that uh, is unclear. The function of that is extremely is going to be extremely clear um, to, to, in order to try to capture the many thoughts and ideas that have been uh, uh, shared today, uh, today and discussed. Um, and and uh, again, to say that w you know, I, I personally, but also I think we collectively, you know, look forward to, to working on, on the issue, the, the issue going forward. So. I'll stop there. I, I simply want to thank um, uh, all of the panelists, all of the speakers, moderators, for their incredible um, uh, contributions today. We deliberately designed the event in such a way that it wasn't going to be just ac academics coming into a room, uh, but actually to bring together policymakers, um, practitioners, and civil society voices. And I think we see the tremendous value of, of, of doing that, and more of that is, is, is needed. So with that, uh, thank you all sincerely for your, your attendance. I realize it's been a long day. Uh, for those of you who are joining us later for the dinner, just to say a little bit of uh, housekeeping on that, I'd ask you to be at the Burren Suite in the Galmont Hotel at quarter past seven. Um, uh, our dear colleague, uh, Alexander Hug, will be delivering his distinguished uh, address in, uh, at immediately before dinner is served at 7.30 um, and then we'll enjoy the evening. But again, my sincere thanks to everybody and uh, my safe journey back to your, back to, to, to your homes. Thank you very much. Take care.